the Climate Project. Your role, your impact is brought to you by National Grid. Feeling the effects of climate change in New England. The growing season for all of these common allergens is actually lengthening. From your health to your carbon footprint. It's like people are eating cheap food at the cost of the environment. The effects of our transportation choices and how we farm our land. You need to be sustainable. It just drops right off here, so the water must have been crashing through. In our next half hour, our team of meteorologists explores what community activists are doing and how you can take action in The Climate Project. Your role, your impact. Across New England, climate change is posing new risks and exposing vulnerabilities in communities. More frequent and extreme weather events are expected to damage critical infrastructure, presenting a safety and financial problem for small towns. Welcome to Dorchester, New Hampshire. You're on Province Road, where there once was a bridge that went all the way across the south branch of the Baker River. Then the floods came in 2005. The heavy rain events, like we're seeing more of with climate change, washed this bridge out, and it's still out to this day. We had a rain event that just washed the bridge away. Dorchester's a town of 350 people, so this is a real struggle for us to put something like this back together again. Sherman, what was the importance of this road? From an emergency management point of view, we only have a north-south exit out of the road. So if we have an event that blocks us getting out on Route 118, we're stuck here. Nothing can come in, nothing can come out. We had a forest fire here and uh, Dorchester doesn't have a fire department. Half the town is uh, taken care of by Canaan and half the town by Romney. Uh, this was Canaan section. They had a fire on the other side of the river and they couldn't get across the river. So why not just buy a new bridge? Well, like I say, we're a small town and a bridge like this uh, costs close to a million dollars to put on a bridge like this. So we applied for state bridge aid, but state bridge aid will cover 75% of the cost. Even 25% of close to a million dollars is too much for the town. We, we just can't afford something like that. When you look at an event like 2005, what does a town like Dorchester do to recover from this event? I mean, it's been 14 years. What, what happens over those 14 years? <laughs> Well, uh, nothing really happens. Uh, you know, uh, you have select boards in town and selectmen come and selectmen go. And we don't have like a town administrator who works full time. So people start it, but uh, just flounders after a while. Nobody picks it up. And before you know it, 14 years have gone by. <laughs> we have the FEMA grant. We have the state bridge aid also. So 5%, we can handle that, so we're in the works now. Uh, we've had all the engineering tests, the hydraulics have been done, and um, uh, they're in the design phase of the bridge now, so we're moving forward. Incredible to think about the power of nature when the water was rushing down here. I mean, that's the road surface up there, pieces of road still left behind. Heavy rain events become more frequent with climate change. We'll see more scenes like this, there's no question. Dorchester, New Hampshire, a good example of a town that realizes there's a big hole to dig out of with climate change. Sherman, tell me what we're looking at here. Well, we're looking at a big washout. This is rainwater that uh, came off uh, the hill in a number of different directions, but the force of the water uh, carries debris with it and large uh, rocks and eventually it clogged up one of the culverts up there and once the culvert is compromised, the water comes over the culvert, onto the road, and off it goes to the races. This just happened year before last. Uh, this is the storm of October 2017. So that was that was just it was a it was a straight up rainstorm, just heavy rains that came down, and mm -hmm. it was it was mm -hmm. there was there anything that stood out about it? Did you have other areas of flooding in town, or was this the only area that flooded out? Oh no, we had a lot of a lot of washouts. <clears throat> this, of course, is the largest one. What stands out to me is is that some of this, this this flooding event that we see, the 2005 event, the event that we had this past year, that this this doesn't come from a hurricane. This doesn't come from a tropical storm. This isn't this isn't Vermont got hit hard in Irene. This is just kind of regular rain events. I mean, are you concerned about Dorchester being vulnerable to more of these rain events? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, and we're in the hills here. Yeah, so the, the water runs right through us and yeah, 
We're, we're uh, looking to see more of these. While many inland communities deal with the threat of intense flooding, urban areas in particular grapple with intense heat and its impact on human health. Researchers expect heat stress to increase in the years ahead because of urbanization, an aging population, and global warming. I've been working with air pollution and how it affects public health uh, in the U.S. and in South America. The biggest pollutant we have is PM2.5, fine particles. They penetrate deep into the lungs and they cause several adverse health effects. For example, cardiovascular disease. Th those are the most studied ones, but also different types of cancer, diabetes, mental health. These tiny, tiny particles are emitted mainly from combustion of fossil fuels. So any car emits these pollutants, any industry emits these pollutants. But this can also be resuspended dust. This can be even biogenic sources, uh, which means from biological sources like trees, like pollen, which are also being affected by climate change. Air conditioning can be a temporal solution for warming temperatures, but unfortunately, not everyone has air conditioning at home. Even if some people can have air conditioning throughout the summer and be protective, like yielded from these higher temperatures, not everyone has access to this. So it, it becomes an inequity problem here. Uh, people with of lower income, people who are in poverty, maybe even those in low income communities and low, lower levels of education, they may live in areas where the buildings are older. How do we supplement the lack of air conditioning for people who are disadvantaged economically? A good way to get around that issue of inequity that not everyone has access to air conditioning is cooling centers in communities, in urban centers specifically, where more people live. These cooling centers can be permanent structures or or temporary structures during the summer where people can come together if they don't have air conditioning at home. People who are skeptical about climate change in general, I mean, we live in a cold climate. Um, what do you say to that? How do, how do we get around that issue? I think we very often forget that we're talking about global climate change, not about a specific city or a specific country. And I think it is very easy to forget that there is a lot more people than just us here right now. And there are many countries that are already facing weather extreme events. It's not only about droughts and flooding, but also the typhoons and the hurricanes all around the world. And these are becoming more frequent. During hot spells in the summer, certain people are particularly at risk for heat-related illness. That's where Boston Healthcare for the Homeless steps in and provides a cool environment, hydration, and medical attention if necessary. It's super important for um, you know for the public to know that if you do have relatives or neighbors who are elderly, make sure to check in on them. If you experience any nausea, vomiting, abundant sweating, weak and, and rapid pulse, um, headaches, those are all signs of heat exhaustion. And if they are not treated by hydrating yourself effectively, by getting into a cool environment, they can progress to include um, loss of consciousness. And that in and of itself is called heat stroke and it's a medical emergency. You have would have to activate 911 to get yourself or a loved one who is experiencing those symptoms immediate medical care. Whenever you're in a public health um, or in a local government um, uh, position, you always have to think about all the allocating resources. But I, I can say, as, as a physician, as someone who, who cares for individuals with heat stroke or heat exhaustion in the summertime, that it is, it is a pressing need, it's an urgent need, and if climate change continues, it will continue to be an even, an even greater one. Rising temperatures are also leading to longer allergy seasons and worsening air quality. Multiple studies show that as the climate warms, pollen seasons are starting sooner, lasting longer, and producing more allergens than in the past. I think we really need to worry about the lengthening of the growing seasons. I think we really need to worry about some of these insects migrating up. Um, and I think we really need to worry about these extreme weather events that they see um, in terms of both flooding, um, leading to increased mold um, exposure. But also we have to be worried about thunderstorms. Thunderstorms have been associated with asthma exacerbations and with exposing people to more allergens in the pollen. The growing season for all of these common allergens is actually lengthening. So when it comes to certain trees, there's some good data for birch especially, which is a really common tree allergen up here. That growing season has actually started earlier, okay? 
which is not good news if you're birch allergic. At the same time, ragweed is where we see some of the best data for a real lengthening of the growing season because ragweed starts up in August and it stops when you get the first frost. But if you're not getting a, uh, the frost until much later because of warm temperatures, then that ragweed is going to continue to grow and going to continue to release pollen. Can you say for sure that there's a correlation between climate change and an increase in allergies and asthma in New England? Yeah, I mean, it's not just a guess that I'm making. There's actually really good data by a lot of people looking at the growing season throughout the United States. And what's interesting is that we're especially victims of it in the northern latitude because if you look down south, the growing seasons haven't changed all that much, but up north, where we really depend on these cold winters, we're really seeing an impact there. Climate change has major impacts on healthcare. Now more than ever, physicians are speaking out on how it is impacting the way they do their job. More pollen around for longer periods of time, yes. I think there's a growing recognition among physicians that this isn't just a sort of population health issue. It matters to our ability to do what we've been trained to do, to deliver medications, to do surgeries. We have as our obligation in healthcare to provide <laughs> health for our, the populations we serve. And a part of that I think people are increasingly recognizing is controlling our greenhouse gas emissions. When you started doing this and working on the relationship between health and climate. Did colleagues and, and your peers think you were crazy? There was certainly a fair amount of, of, of questioning looks about why would someone who's a doctor, a medical doctor, and a pediatrician care about something like climate change? I mean, at the time I started with this, you know, people were reasonably well informed in the medical community about climate change, but it really wasn't clear what it had to do with the practice of medicine. Um, people are less um, uncertain about that today, having been through, for example, Hurricane Maria, which knocked out an IV fluid manufacturing plant, a plant that made these bags for IV fluid and, and medications, that caused a national shortage of availability of these critical medical supplies. So one storm disrupted the entire nation's supply, and uh, even here in Boston. We know that hurricanes, because of climate change, are getting stronger. Uh, they're putting down more rain, they're moving more slowly. Storms like that are, are going to be more likely than not moving forward. So there's a growing recognition that climate change not only matters to health profoundly, but it matters to our ability to do our jobs as doctors. As the general population becomes more environmentally conscious, commuters are seeking greener options. Coming up, how one public transit agency is investing in the future and reducing its carbon footprint. Today, more than three million people in Massachusetts commute to workplaces, the majority of them in cars. One report out earlier this year found Boston to have the worst rush hour traffic congestion of any city in the United States. The MBTA on a typical day uh, serves, serves 1.4 million trips um, to our customers. Public transit on a passenger mile basis has a much lower carbon footprint than driving, for instance, in a single occupancy vehicle. It also reduces congestion, fewer people on the roads, fewer cars moving slowly in and out the city, emitting uh, greenhouse gases. So we believe transit provides a significant benefit in this regard. The city of Boston's goal of being carbon free by 2050 and some of the ways we're working to be a partner with them is we are exploring ways uh, to transition our bus fleet first to hybrid vehicles and eventually to all electric vehicles. Subway system is already uh, electric. We think we have a role to play in this transition and we look forward to working with our partners in the city. The MBTA is in the process of introducing new cars on the red and orange line. That service is going to become more reliable and we're also going to add capacity there. Transportation is now the largest source of carbon emissions in the United States. In many U.S. cities and towns, Single vehicles have made it the single greatest polluter due to emissions thanks to so many cars on the road. But what are the statistics compared to other modes of transportation? We'll come here to the production line to find out how these new cars are helping the environment. The new car will be powered by uh, electricity uh, instead of using the oil and the gas. So we believe, you know, for the energy assumption, that would be the best choice for the public. And how about the insulation for these new cars? Is it better? The uh, old car was made uh, 20 years ago, 
But right now, you know, we use all the technology. And our assembly group, they use the latest installation procedure to make sure we provide the best quality car to the MET as well as the public passenger. So how many people work on the assembly of these cars? So it's around the 60 or 70 people working for one car from step by step until the final assembly. And what stage are we in right now? So this is just the beginning of the assembly. So you see the workers here, they are just cut the wiring. So next step, they will grab the, all the equipment here to install the equipment. I actually love the amount of space that's in here. It just makes it feel very roomy, very comfortable. Yeah. The lighting just makes you feel like there's a lot of daylight. During the design stage, you know, we uh, try our best to make sure we can have more space for the passenger. We put all the control equipment behind the corner hatch and try to save the more space for the passenger for increased quality of the seating. So uh, that's why, you know, we have the final product here. So we believe you know, we can make the uh, uh, passenger or the public happy. Virtually every aspect of how we live, from mode of transportation to what we buy and eat, has an impact on the environment. One way some families are making a positive impact is by considering their food's carbon footprint. Globally, up to one third of greenhouse gas emissions comes from our food, how it's produced, how it's transported. The big question when you come into a grocery store like this one, the one I shop in in Boston, how do we choose our food more sustainably to cut down on the so-called climate cost of food? If we're going to talk about climate, we know that plant-based diets are the best thing you can do for the environment. Why? Because they require less fossil fuels to produce. Okay, not to mention, depending on if you're buying organic or not, you are fertilizers, pesticides, and all that stuff. What we're going to be filling up our basket is with is mainly plants, because that's the best thing you can do for the environment. I happen to really, really like kale. <laughs> this is massive. That's a lot of kale. <laughs> that's a lot of kale. <laughs> but I happen to be a huge fan of tofu. Look at all these choices. Tofu is basically pressed soybeans, and it is a protein food. It creates three and a half kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions to produce tofu, compared to 105 kilograms of greenhouse gases for beef. That's a huge difference. Yeah, it's more than 30 times. So when people are paying cheap prices for food, it's because they're produced cheaply and they are leading to climate change. So it's like people are eating cheap food at the cost of the environment. So legumes, peas, beans, and lentils are really important for the environment. They actually contribute nitrogen to the soil. That's a good thing. I love these red lentils. They are so fantastic. I shouldn't be ashamed to be getting veggies out of the frozen food aisle. You should be proud. First, really inexpensive. Secondly, very nutritious. Some people think, oh, my local fresh produce is the healthiest, more nutritious. No, that's not true. With a lot of these frozen vegetables, they come to you straight from the farm because they're flash frozen on site. Convenience is important here in the U.S., so you want to get your box of lettuce, go ahead. You know, and hydroponics, no fertilizers, no pesticides. Right? That's huge. That means you're not dumping all of those chemicals into the environment. From the grocery store in Boston, where you can purchase fresh box farms, to here in Millis, where the produce is actually grown inside these enclosures. Year-round production. That's, that's the first thing it offers. It doesn't matter what the weather is. We basically remove weather from the equation. So it can be a snowy day, a rainy day, um, extremely cold and we get production of, of the plants. And is this a somewhat new farming technique? Is it just expanding? Is it becoming more popular where people are more sensitive to where their food is coming from? It's new from the standpoint that it's what's called controlled environment agriculture, where every component, temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide levels, the nutrients dissolved in the water, it's all very tightly controlled. Um, but it's not new from the standpoint of growing inside. For example, we've been growing in greenhouses for many hundreds of years now. Um, so it's the combination of, of those two and what's really made it possible is the emergence of uh, LED lighting. That's, that's the reason why you see those colors. And so we, you're not wasting energy producing wavelengths that the plant is not using. So there's a little bit of efficiency gain there. It's intensity and it's uh, the uh, coolness of those lights. So you can put a lot of light into a very small area and not have it overheat. Hydroponic growing is literally simply means a growth on water. So instead of soil, we pass water around the roots 
and the nutrients for the plants is, are dissolved in the water. Every bit of the water that we use goes through the plant. This is called transpiration, plant transpiration, and that's how the mineral nutrients for the plants are pulled into the plant, is by this process of bringing water through the plant. Where do you see this sector of agriculture going? Is it going to continue to grow significantly? Is this just the beginning of maybe a real turning point in how we get our food? Yeah, our feeling is that it, it is a turning point. Um, it's a very new industry. Um, but there's a lot of technologies that are coming together. So it's going to be basically an enhanced quality of food as well as just being able to be produced year-round. Still ahead, finding ways to conserve resources, the increasing popularity of sustainable gardening, and how you can get started when The Climate Project, your role, your impact continues. While climate change can seem like a daunting problem to take on, families across New England are seeking ways to mitigate its effects in both small and large ways. A recent study shows that two-thirds of Massachusetts residents are prepared to make big lifestyle changes to combat climate change. Today we're at Volante Farms to learn about sustainable farming and pick up a few useful tips on how to create your own garden. What does sustainable farming mean? So for us, as far as the greenhouse goes, we do uh, many, many different things in here um, to be sustainable. Uh, first things foremost, we recycle the rainwater that falls from the sky. So we have a big 10,000 gallon rainwater collection tank out back. And then these benches that we're standing near right now are called flood benches. We are able to fill the benches, so the tray fills up with water. The plant's roots are able to soak up the water from the roots, and then whatever water is not used gets recycled to the next bench that we're watering. <laughs> Over the years, uh, have you noticed any differences in how you've grown a garden here? Yeah, so especially in the greenhouse, we have introduced over the past few years biological controls, which are basically good bugs eating bad bugs. So you can see that as you walk around. In each hanging plant and in each tray, we have these little things called sachets, which are basically filled with um, good bugs and some food for them to eat in the meantime before they find the bad bugs to eat. How can someone start their own garden? Pick a nice sunny spot that gets plenty of sun. And then you're going to want to till your soil, you know, mix it up, get some good air in there, and probably get your soil tested if you haven't before just to make sure all your levels are good for what you want to be growing. And then select plants that you like to eat. I mean, it's simple, right? If you like lettuce, plant some lettuce. If you don't like eggplant, don't plant eggplant. What we're doing today is going to be the easiest way to get into gardening if you haven't already. Um, and we're going to be planting patio tomatoes. Okay, so how do we plant them? All Get right, so this is one of our plug trays. This is kind of how we start a lot of our plants here. So you just dig a little hole in this four inch pot, and you just plug it right in and you cover it up. And it doesn't Even matter. I can't screw it up. It's perfect. <laughs> oh, they smell so good. They do. They, it smells like summer, doesn't it? You need to be sustainable. My brothers and I are the fourth generation owners of this farm, so year after year, you know, we're always trying to think of how we can improve our relationship with Mother Nature and how to further you know, just save um, natural resources as much as we can. Now that we've learned about sustainable gardening, what about low-income families who can't afford to make a big lifestyle change? What resources are available to them? We head to the Urban Farming Institute to find out. On a couple of these plants, some, okay. some life's still there. I see. Um, and on your right, we have the curly kale. The Urban Farming Institute is a wonderful place. Our mission is truly to create a place so that we can develop urban farmers. But the other part of the mission is to clearly engage the community, get everybody growing, to hopefully affect the health of the entire community. So the kale right there, that's still alive? Well, you can still see some green. Those leaves are still alive and they're actually just beginning to come back to life. And actually over the next couple of weeks, those will continue to grow and they'll give you a little harvest. It's important to get the community involved because number one, our grandparents and our great grandparents actually farmed. Everybody was growing food. Everybody was farming at one point. That's how you lived, that's how you ate. So now we are so removed from the whole growing system, the whole network, that we want everybody to learn where their food comes from again. From the littlest two-year-old, I want her to learn that a carrot does not necessarily come from bird's eye, but it actually comes from out of the ground and you just kind of brush it off and you can eat it. Climate can be variable on any, in any given year. All of our farmers know that. But um, for example, we'll, we will have swings about two years ago um, it was just really, really, we kept waiting for the heat to come for our tomatoes. And sure enough, the heat came 
and all of the tomatoes were ripe all at once. So there's all kinds of things that can happen and climate change will only exacerbate those, I feel, uh, as we go on. We're growing food, but we don't just grow food, we grow people as well. With climate change an everyday reality, New Englanders continue to be progressive and forward-thinking with transportation, sustainability, and taking preemptive measures when it comes to our health. Find things like lentils, other beans, peas, wonderful, wonderful legumes are going to help cut our carbon footprint. And also, they're not creating methane. We have to remember that it's not about just us or them, it's, it's about us as humans together, and it's also not even just about humans, it's about the ecological consequences, the wildlife, the oceans, the glaciers in the poles. It, it's about the entire earth. I bike year round uh, to work. Rain, sleet, snow or shine. Not only is it good for my health, you know, I don't have to worry about where I'm going to park every day. I'm not sitting in traffic. I'm a diehard bike commuter and uh, it would be very hard for me to give that up. The Climate Project, Your Role, Your Impact, is brought to you by National Grid.